Great. Good, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Maureen Conway. I'm the Executive Director of the Economic Opportunities Program here at the Aspen Institute, and I'm delighted to uh, welcome you to today's conversation, Time to Care, a discussion on improving paid leave policies for workers, businesses, and our economy. Uh, this discussion is part of our Working in America series of conversations in which we look at the situation facing working people today in, in, in the economy and consider issues that affect the ability of, of American workers to really earn a living in today's economy. Um, this issue of work obviously is a big issue, so we have lots of events in this series, and we hope you'll come to more of them. Um, and, and it's such a big issue because work is such a central part of our lives. It's uh, where we spend a lot of our waking hours. It's a critical source of identity, and it's um, also very importantly, it's how we support ourselves and our families. Um, 
despite uh, 2013 being one of the, the best years we've had in more than 15 years in the stock market, the returns to the labor market have not come back so well in this um, recovery from uh, the very terrible recession that we experienced. Uh, wages remain low. The jobs that are being created uh, tend to be low wage, part time, and they offer very few benefits. Median annual earnings in 2012, which is the most recent year available from the uh, from the Census Bureau were $31,921. So that's the middle, that's half. That's also part of a declining trend. They've been declining since 2005. Um, so wages are really important. Uh, this is the money that families rely on to pay the rent, the mortgage, buy food, and all the necessities of life. And this is how they earn money to, to save for retirement and all those things as well. Um, but in this series, as I mentioned, we talk about a variety of things, and, there's, and there are a lot of other issues that we think about in terms of the job. And one of it is how the job matches with our lives, and can we sort of have time to care uh, while we're fulfilling our obligations to work. Um, as you can see from the fact sheet on your chair, and there are materials on your chair, uh, roughly 40 million Americans today do not have a single paid sick leave, a sick day. Uh, so this creates a whole host of challenges as people try to juggle sort of the obligations of work and the obligations of caring, uh, both for themselves and for family members. Um, so, uh, so in this conversation today, we, as we do in, in a lot of our conversations, we have a variety of different perspectives we get to hear from on this issue. We can think about these challenges and how they really uh, play out for people today and what are some ideas for improving the situation and going forward. Uh, before we begin, I would very much like to express our, our deep gratitude to our sponsors for these conversations, uh, the Ford Foundation, and we are very happy to have um, Anawadi of the Ford Foundation here with us today. There she is, thank you. Uh, the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation and the Serdna Foundation. Um, I also have a, a couple of little announcements. So uh, as usual, I'll ask everyone to silence their phones, um, but please feel free to uh, join the Twitter conversation. Our hashtag for today's event is Talk Good Jobs, and it is also on um, the agenda in your materials. Um, I also want to mention that there is a resource table in case you, in case you missed it on your way in. Um, it has some additional background material related to today's discussion. It includes an, in, an opinion piece by John Fury uh, that recently appeared in the Spotlight on Poverty and materials from our colleagues in class and, and other materials. Um, uh, so I am just going to now very, very quickly introduce our, our panelists and our moderator for today's event. You have their bios in your material. I encourage you to take a look at them if you haven't already. We have a really um, excellent panel for you today to have this important conversation. So let me just uh, kind of put the names to faces. I think you can guess which one is John Fury. So I will start down there, President of Communications and Director of Public Affairs, Quinn Gillespie and Associates. Uh, next to John is Allison Earle, Senior Research Scientist, Heller School for Social Policy and Management at Brandeis University. Uh, next we have McKinney Howell, who is owner and chef, Plum Bistro Restaurants, and author of Plum, an award-winning vegan cookbook. So if you're in the market for one, take a look for it. Um, uh, next we have Ellen Bravo, who's the Executive Director of Family Values at Work. And, uh, and right next to me, we have Bridget Schulte, social issue reporter for the Washington Post. We're very glad to have her moderating this discussion. She has a book coming out in March called Overwhelmed, Work, Love, and Play When No One Has the Time. We all thought that was about us. So, um, so hopefully you'll look for that soon. And with that, I will turn it over to Bridget. Thank you. and wanted to understand, whoa, sorry, is that too loud? Did I just push some weird button back there? Oh, okay, and wanted to, wanted to understand how, how U.S. family policy was part of the equation of this time pressure that just about every survey out there shows is sort of increasing the sense that people don't feel like you have enough time to do in a day what you need and want to do, both at work and at home. So um, the, first, the first thing that I'll tell you, I went to California and where they have um, a state paid leave policy and um, uh, met someone there who was working for a very small firm. Uh, they were very worried about her taking paid leave. They didn't know how they were gonna be able to uh, cover it when, while she was gone. Um, 
She very much wanted leave. She was in her 40s. She tried for years. Uh, this was a very wanted child. Uh, and they worked it out. And, um, and the owner of the company said, I didn't have paid leave when I had my child 23 years ago, and I wish I did, so we're going to make it work. And when I, what I saw was she had taken her leave, was now back at work, and her husband was taking his leave. And when I called to say, can I come over and talk to him about what it's like, you know, they were trying to encourage more men to take leave. Uh, she called him, it was 5 o'clock, and she shook her head. She said, I'm sorry, he hasn't had a shower yet. And I got the phone. <laughs> and I just thought every single mother in the world could totally relate. And like, finally, men are going to get it when they, you know, <laughs> come home at the end of the day. It's like, what did you do all day? And you stop. <laughs> like, the baby's fingernail. Um, just, uh, and, and just very briefly then, um, uh, I spent some time in Denmark, and just uh, there's a new study that's just come out in I about Iceland um, about encouraging fathers to take paid leave. And what they're finding is that when they've taken paid leave early on, um, the, these fathers are much more um, equal partners in childcare and housework um, <coughs> three years later, which is a very interesting and exciting thing. And the last thing that I'll mention before turning it over to this fabulous panel is. Then I looked to see, well, what, it, what have we done at a national level? And I followed the 2009 uh, congressional debate about um, giving paid leave to federal workers. Um, it was cut from eight weeks of paid leave down to four weeks of paid leave, passed the House. Uh, and then um, Daryl Issa put out a YouTube video with all sorts of different um, despots from North Korea and Cuba and Venezuela at, with the catch line, how could these guys be wrong on paid leave? So I will just leave it at that, that uh, trying to understand sort of the landscape, uh, the political landscape as well as the cultural landscape here. First of all, Ellen, let me ask you, um, you have given speeches about your own life, about uh, having a, a toddler and a six-week-old baby and your back going out and you go to the doctor and you're like, he's like, oh, just get your mommy or your housekeeper to come help you and your husband is stuck at work. You know, talk about the challenges that people face out there without having kind of paid leave policies. Sure. Thanks so much. And thanks to the Aspen Institute for hosting this. So uh, familyvaluesatwork.org, there's a story bank and there's lots of these stories, unfortunately. Uh, what it means in real terms for people, it means a four-day maternity leave. It means you tear ligaments turning a mattress in your domestic work job, and the doctor says you need surgery, but you can't because you'll lose your job, so you use a splint in ice. It means your kid has an asthma attack, and you take the, person to, to take the child to the emergency room and then have her sit in the car while you finish your shift at the restaurant because you'll be fired if you don't. There's all kinds of examples like this of what it means for kids, for seniors, for families, for all the things we say we value as a nation. And then there's also what it means in terms of just financial security. Uh, because after all, women and men are breadwinners and caregivers, and we need to be able to do both. It means one day's lost pay, that's a month's worth of diapers. Three days or a little more is a month's worth of groceries. You'll see people saying, what do I do? bus pass or phone? What do I do when they shut off the utilities? Um, and you heard the numbers, the 40 million who don't have a single paid sick day. We need to understand a couple other things. There are millions more who earn paid sick days but can't use them to care for a sick family member. There are many more who earn them but get told you'll get a demerit every time you use one. And then paid leave, you know, this was to me the, the, one of the most surprising figures. One out of ten women go back before four weeks because half of them don't get any income while they're out on leave. And those who do, they're mainly using vacation. It's a joy to have a baby. It's not a vacation. <laughs> and we can do better as a nation, and we absolutely need to. Mm -hmm. Allison, um, you know, talk a little bit. You've done a lot of work looking at uh, paid po you know, leave policies. Um, and inequality or uh, and in different circumstances. Can you talk a little bit about public and family health impacts? Sure. Um, so there, uh, there are so many, really, <laughs> that I could, um, it could take a while to go through them. But um, I think they can be grouped uh, in part by um, who you're looking at. So thinking about workers themselves, um, we know that without paid sick days, um, People delay treatment. Um, they go to work when they're sick. 
Um, they then sort of increase the spread of disease. Um, they go in and they're not being fully productive when they um, are sick. Um, they uh, tend to um, not be able to do the things that would prevent uh, extending the duration of their illness. So uh, they wait, they delay going to the doctor, uh, and then they're sick for longer and out of work longer and having to deal with health issues longer. Um, so what we also know on the positive side is when people do have access to paid, uh, paid medical leave, it gives them time to fully recover. Um, they can sort of comply with the treatments, they can do the rehab that they need, they're more likely to be able to go back to work and to do so more quickly. Um, on the, on the side of sort of family, um, having paid leave we know allows parents the time to take care of their kids and we know that when parents are involved that their kids recover more quickly from illnesses and injuries, they have shorter hospital stays. Uh, it also ideally um, allows parents to ensure their kids get preventive care, which, which hopefully obviates the need in the first place for long, um, long absences because of um, illness. Um, uh, I did some more uh, research with Jody Hyman and we found that parents who have paid sick days um, are five times as likely to be able to stay home and take care of sick children themselves. Um, this also allows parents um, to keep their kids home, to get them healthy before sending them back to school or daycare, which is a perfect place for spreading disease. Everybody's close by, people are touching a lot. Um, and similarly, um, uh, when you think about paid sick days and their um, importance for public health, um, it's especially important for workers who have a lot of contact with the public. Um, there are, uh, unfortunately, two groups um, of workers that are um, least likely to have access to paid sick days. Um, this is food service workers. Only 23% or 22% now of those workers um, have access to paid sick days. Um, and also workers in nursing homes are less likely to have access to paid sick days. Um, in nursing homes in particular, you're dealing with, um, uh, they have contact with people who have lower immune um, you know, systems and ability to fight diseases, um, and people are coming to work sick. Um, so it's really just there on, on, on so many levels. There are lots of you know public health reasons um, for paid sick and medical leave. Mm. Um, Bikini, your restaurant, you you instituted a policy of paid sick days before there was any requirement. Um, talk about why. Why did you decide to do that? Um, what was your motivation? Um, what do you see around other businesses? Why are other restaurants doing or not doing the same thing? Well. I don't know that other restaurants, I don't know why other restaurants are not doing it, but um, I'm a part of the Main Street Alliance of Washington and it is a coalition of small businesses. And so it's where the, the ideas about paid sick leave and the implementation of paid sick leave actually meet. Because we, um, we decided to implement it before it was a law because it was just the right thing to do. We wanted to have higher employee retention uh, we wanted to create a nice place for people to work. I wanted to have a place where I wanted to work. Because I lived and worked in New York for 10 years, and some of my jobs were great, but some were not that great. But I believe that when you become a business owner, you then have a responsibility. And so we are the folks that are actually, actually implementing these policies. So there has to be somewhere where we can come together and talk about how they affect us. Because what I've found in working with Main Street business owners and in working with other business owners in the community is that most folks think similarly. And most folks want to do something. They don't know how. They don't know how it's going to affect their bottom line. You have a lot of uh, business owners who are very family oriented and would of course support their workers, but English is their second language. And so you tell them you're going to pay for somebody to what appears to be call out drunk because if you have a lot of college workers, people are like, oh, well, they're just going to call out drunk. But if you really explain the law, like we have it in Seattle, it's actually, it covers domestic violence, it covers um, for your parents, for your children, it's paid sick and safe leave. So once a lot of the business owners who would be the ones that would be implementing this law actually came to the table and sat down and talked about it, 
everyone understood that it was something that needed to pass. And I feel like a lot of small business owners felt like they wanted to support it, but they didn't want to impact their bottom line negatively and they didn't want to be taken advantage of. But when the worker and the owner and the small business owner actually come together and talk, you realize there's a lot of common ground there, which is one of the reasons why we started just to talk to people in our community, talk to business owners, and get a lot of support for it. Um, John, um, you, uh, you bring the, the masculine pr perspective here on this panel. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you, you also, um, you know, talk a little bit about from the, how you came to these issues on work and family, um, you know, and, and we, need the, we need the spotlight back on them. You know, and from, from the Republican perspective, um, you know, when I've reported on, on some of these issues, a, a lot of what you hear is, you know, families are a private responsibility, um, don't have kids if you can't afford to take care of them, um, don't put mandates on businesses, it's going to hurt businesses. Um, you know, kind of talk about how you came to these issues and, and how you approach them from the Republican perspective. Well, thank you for having me. I, I would imagine that my politics uh, disagrees with uh, most of the folks in this room. Um, but I do think that uh, when we're I think how I came to this issue is uh, my wife and I had two kids. And what we discovered is kids are expensive. And thankfully, both my wife and I do pretty well. We make some money. Uh, and we're able to, to take care of our little uh, lovelies. Um, but uh, my wife's salary basically goes to pay for a nanny. And if you don't have, A, if you're not married and don't have that opportunity, and B, if you don't have enough money, you know, the stress that we put on uh, parents and families is am amazing in the society, and our government really needs to think, rethink about that, because I, I am a pro-life Republican. I believe strongly in families. I believe strongly in having more children. I think that we, we have a, a, a perilously low birth rate, which is why we have so many immigrants in this country, uh, and, you know, because we need the workers. And uh, if we want to think holistically about all of these issues, and I am not the expert that these folks are, I'm just from my own personal experience and from a political perspective, um, you know, we've got to rethink how we take care of kids in this family, in this, in this, in this country. And, um, you know, the idea that uh, businesses, as McKinney pointed out, are against finding some sort of cooperative relationship, I don't think is right, because they want healthy workers. They want healthy families. They don't want parents worried so much about their kids that they're not productive. And they also don't want, uh, you know, they don't want to have to retrain new employees all the time and fire all these employees who come in and, and, and can't come in because they have sick kids. And I also think that as we grow older and we worry more about our adult, our, 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 the grandparents, and how do we take care of them, um, you know, we have to think more holistically, are we a pro-family government or not? And can we rethink how we address family structure in this country. Because there's no doubt in my mind that families are really, really under stress. And if you, if you look at I mean, the, the, the State of the Union tonight, they're going to talk a lot about, I think the President's going to talk a lot about income inequality. And uh, the Republicans are going to talk a lot about opportunity. Well, and I think Jeb Bush has been talking about trying to do social mobility. Well, nothing gets you stuck more unable to move up if you don't have a stable family life and if you don't have the ability to take care of your children. And uh, I think that that is really the biggest difference between the haves and have-nots is the ability to take care of the kids and make sure that they are going to school, make sure that they're well taken care of, and make sure that they you know, su can succeed in life. So I think that as Republicans you know, talk about these issues, and the other, the other point of this is Republicans are getting clobbered in the female vote. Now, I don't, I don't think that this is just a female issue. I think this is an issue that, and the other thing about men is what they're finding out a lot more men are staying at home. And they're, they're having a hell of a time finding jobs. So, uh, you know, this is not just a, a, a woman's issue. This is a man and woman's issue. This is a kid's issue. And I think that from a um, uh, Republican standpoint, it makes a lot of sense for us to get in the ground floor and start having conversations about how to rejigger our government to make it more family friendly. So that's kind of why I'm here. All right, well, let's start talking about some of these specific policies that are either proposals or, or already underway. McKinney, could you, um, you know, we, st we started talking about the uh, paid sick days in, in Seattle. 
you know, talk a little bit about what the law does. I know you spoke a little bit about it, but can you go into a little bit more detail and the impact that it's having? So we, we studied the law in San Francisco mm -hmm. when it first came to passing, and, I, and um, our law is a tiered law. So it takes into account micro businesses, medium-sized businesses, and large businesses. And so you get three, five, or seven sick days depending on what size business that you work in. And the reason that we came up for that tiering, like I said, was once, because we actually, when all of the business owners sat down, we realized that business <coughs> owners were for finding a way to have, to help workers. Because there, I, I employ 48 people, and it takes all 48 of us to run <laughs> the restaurant, and it took all 48 of us for me to be able to write the cookbook and all of that. We have, um, we have four restaurants, a, a food truck and a commercial kitchen. Now that growth that happened, um, when I started I only had one restaurant. So I'm not saying that paid sick leave grew the businesses, but I'm saying that it helped to enable employee retention, which helped to grow businesses. And I think that um, a lot of what business owners realized was that it's only a half a percent of your bottom line. It helps your retention, which you end up making up. The way that the, the law is tiered makes it so small businesses or micro businesses can survive. And if you have, if you're a mom and pop, or if you're, if you just decided you're going to open up your cafe and you only have two employees, then you more than likely don't need it. So that was taken into account when we designed the law as well. Um, the implementation has been fairly. It's been very easy actually. It's a it's a line on uh, it's a line item on your check. Uh, bookkeepers can do it. It. Um, we haven't had any crazy hiccups. We haven't had any complaints in the city. It seems like everyone just kind of accepted that it passed and started to implement the law. We haven't had any gross abuses of the law, and we haven't really heard any complaints from it. As a matter of fact, when I was in a meeting about the minimum wage conversation that's going on, we, some of the other business owners with the Main Street were talking about how if more business owners knew how good it would be, they would have signed up earlier to actually support paid sick leave because it was that easy to implement. And one thing I noticed was a huge bump in business when word got out that we actually supported the worker. Because I think that, like what John was saying, like I don't know that you have to identify as Republican or, or a Democrat to identify as a person that values family and a person that is pro-family. And pro-family doesn't have to necessarily associate with what we're all thinking. But like, there are a lot of people that are pro-family. There are a lot of people that want to help. Like, I have a worker who had a, a child, and his mother was there for a long time. When his mother left, their life got turned upside down. So having paid leave for him, he's taking his son to the doctor on Friday. He knows that he can go. He knows that he, you know, his job is safe. So having people work for you that understand that you are pro-family and that you will look out for them helps you to retain them. And the consistency of your product is better which he, it keeps customers coming back and continues to grow your business, which is why I think it's a big part of how we went from two restaurants to now four, and I was able to actually have enough time that I needed to write the book. Hmm. Which is fabulous. I give it for gifts for everybody. My husband just cooked something. <laughs> two nights ago. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Yeah, Allison, um, you know, if you could kind of expand on that, what else is going on at the state level, state and local level? Sure, and I'll talk a little bit about um, the research that's been done to evaluate some of um, what's gone on at the state level and just say first that I think um, while a number of us um, here have been working on um, some of the initiatives mm -hmm. at the federal level, the Healthy Families Act, um, and trying to get um, some, some paid leave as opposed to um, just leave, uh, that there has been much more, you know, in the absence of the success of that, that there have been a growing number of state and local efforts, both sort of city level, like in San Francisco, Milwaukee, Washington, D.C. Um, but the two, the, two, um, the two states where there's been the most work done um, are in California and New Jersey, and I would say California is sort of most because um, that law has been in place. The, um, paid family and uh, medical leave there has been in place since 2004. Um, so, and I think when, uh, prior to when that legislation passed, the main concerns were, um, you know, from business owners about um, what kind of impact this was going to have, just administering it, 
was going to be very um, costly. How are they going to manage when um, workers were taking time off? Although, of course, workers were taking time off anyway because they had to manage it. They just weren't getting paid for it. So, um, but we could we could go go through some of the um, the arguments one by one. But um, the research that's been done um, has found that in general, right, the paid family medical leave. Um, by and large, has either had a positive effect or no effect. Um, one of the surveys asked about um, on, on productivity, 89% um, of employers said um, there was no effect or um, uh, either a positive effect or no, no noticeable effect in terms of profitability and performance. Again, 91%. Uh, in terms of turnover, 96% it hadn't had any um, negative impact and also on employee morale, that it actually um, uh, had had a positive effect. Um, one of the ways that they do it, right, is that uh, most of the leave takers and the way that they avoid some of the costs is by um, shifting you know, work around um, so that they don't actually, at least in the short term, leave have to go out and hire somebody else, which can increase costs. Um, uh, I think the, the other pieces that come up in terms of like how these have been implemented, how effective they've been, um, is the issue of awareness that um, laws get passed. Those of us who are in and been involved in it, like we know about it, we're jumping for joy, you know, when we get the news that, you know, um, in Newark there's new um, uh, paid sick days, but m most um, employees are not aware. Um, that these laws exist. They don't know who's eligible. They don't know whether they're eligible. Um, so I try and keep that in mind when I'm looking at what the impacts are. So once we actually get um, the, the word out there and lots of employees do know uh, that it's there, like the potential for positive impacts is much greater. Um, but uh, uh, just to give you an example, in California, um, 91% um, of respondents said, um, oh, so I'm sorry. So the other issue was around abuse. I wanted to just mention the other concern that people had. Uh, but that was also something that employers really didn't find um, was, a was a problem, that 91% said they had never heard um, of instances where there had been any abuse. Um, so and, and just on the public health side um, and the, the impacts in terms of health, um, one group that there's been some research on for which the paid sick leave and, and paid medical leave um, uh, is likely to be particularly important are parents whose children have special health care needs. Um, so there have been some good research looking at that. Um, but only 18% of these families in California even knew about the paid family um, leave insurance. Um, and only 5% had used it. So big issue is how you get the word out, um, how you, you know, we don't, we don't know enough about sort of why that's happening, if that's just advertising, you know, if there's a role for the employer um, to try and make sure their employees know, um, you know, th those issues have to be, um, have to be worked out. Um, uh, California also found there was a, a new study that's just coming out. Um, that found that there's been an increase in breastfeeding rates you know, that's come, um, come about sort of as a result of the change in paid family and medical leave. So I think we're starting to see some of the benefits come out. And when we get more awareness and more take up, we'll begin to see even more. And, and, uh, as you're talking about the California um, experience, I came across a report by um, the Society of Human Resource Managers um, from January 2010. The title was Paid Family Leave Act, Less Onerous Than Predicted. Mm. So uh, apparently, uh, when I spoke with the Chamber of Commerce out there, and apparently there was a lot of sturm and drong and uh -huh. fear that it was going to just t businesses right. are going to tank, and they have not found that that's the case. And even the Chamber of Commerce told me that. Um, so Ellen, let's move to the federal level. So we've been talking about this mo movement that's going on at the state level, largely because of the vacuum at the federal level. Uh, we've got a couple policies um, proposals now. Uh, talk a little bit about kind of what's gone on or why nothing's gone on, so to speak, <laughs> and what's going on now, and what. And then John will get into the politics and the prospects of it. Sure. I, I wanted to mention a few. Um, one of the things about doing things on the state level. I mean, 25 years ago, almost 26 years ago, we won 
unpaid family leave in Wisconsin. We were one of the first states. And one of the things that we won was shorter than the federal law turned out to be. Um, we won it because we took a bunch of kids to Madison who t all talked about why their parents had needed leave and what it meant for them. And one of the things that we won was that anybody could use, if at any time that you'd earned, you, you could choose to use for your family leave purposes, and, but your employer couldn't make you. And what that meant was that men who had accrued paid sick time could use it and be good fathers, as many wanted to do. It meant that people could use it for adopted leave. It meant that if you wanted, you know, under the federal family leave law, if you have vacation, your employer can say you have to use it all up and count it as family leave. As I said, it's not a vacation, even if it's a joy. <laughs> so, but, but you don't have to do that for the time that you have in Wisconsin. So there are these models that have been created that show us a better way. And for example, in DC and New York City, two things just happened in December and January to improve existing paid sick days laws because if we're pro-family, we should be pro-everybody's family and that means we don't leave out tip workers and we don't leave out workers in um, smaller companies and that's really exciting. In Newark, just, just passed today unanimously, and Jersey City and New York and Portland, the paid sick days law includes language that says if there's a public health emergency and schools are closed, like in Wisconsin today where it's too cold for kids to stand outside for the bus, then parents can stay home and use that time. I'll tell you, there are a lot of eight-year-olds watching four-year-olds in Milwaukee today and lots of other places because they don't have that because they took it away from us. And um, that's really important. So those kind of provisions. In the New Jersey bills, there's also provision of carving in direct care workers, people who have direct contact with the public, child care, food service, home health care, even if they're in the smaller business, that they'll get the larger number of days because of the importance for the public health. So those are some good models. We have some great uh, federal legislation. I want to mention three bills. One was just introduced, the Family Act, which would create a, a social insurance fund. Um, employees and employers would each pay a very small amount of money, two-tenths of a percent of payroll, into that fund. And then there'd be enough that when you're sick, you could, or at, when you have a new child, or a serious illness or a serious family member has an illness, you could use that time to draw up to two-thirds of your pay for up to 12 weeks. Um, and you know, I have to say, I was on a bipartisan commission on leave in 1995, appointed by Congress to study the impact of the Family and Medical Leave Act. Six people appointed because our organizations had worked to pass family leave. Six appointed because they worked to stop it. <laughs> Try to imagine what those meetings were like. <laughs> and unanimously, that group, which almost agreed on nothing, unanimously agreed to encourage states to experiment with forms of wage replacement, because it was pretty clear from the research that we commissioned that people couldn't do it. We asked, how do you support yourself while you're on leave? 9%, today it's 10%, said by going on public assistance. And for the lowest fifth, 20% went on public assistance. How does that make sense as a society? So the Family Act would be a great move forward. There's also the Healthy Families Act, which would provide a guarantee a minimum number that workers could earn a minimum number of paid sick days. And the Pregnancy Fairness Act. This is a shocking thing. It's, it's like being in high school and learning about Watergate. <laughs> really? They can fire you? I thought they couldn't fire you for being pregnant. Well, they, don't, they can't fire you, but they don't have to treat you differently. They can be mean to everybody. And so if you need more water or more bathroom breaks, they can say, sorry, the other workers don't get to have water or bathroom breaks, so you don't either. Sometimes fair means not exactly the same. And that's what this bill would do. It would make sure that workers have accommodations if they need them, like w workers do under the Americans with Disability Act. So there's some great track record. We have every reason to hope that colleagues will, uh, of John's party will start thinking like John. Because not only is it good to be pro-family, there's two other reasons why they should do it. One is it's pro-jobs. What happens when you don't have pay? Like there are two and a half times as many people, who, by the way, who needed to use family leave and were eligible for it and didn't take it in the latest survey that was done 
and mainly it's because they can't afford it. We all know what that means in terms of health. But what about people who do take it and lose their jobs? One, almost one in four people in the United States of America has either been fired or threatened with being fired for taking time to care for themselves or a loved one. What does that mean? It means you look bad on paper. You start to get a spotty work record. You get bad credit. They won't hire you when they do your credit check. Then you haven't even spied your work record. Then they say you have a bad work ethic because you were being a good family member. You, in fact, have a great ethic that we want to combine. President Clinton, last year, on the 20th anniversary of the signing of FMLA, he said, you know, people want to be good parents and they want to succeed at their jobs. If you take one away to get the other, the whole country pays a grievous price and every life is diminished. Pro-jobs, pro-economy, because people need money in their pockets to be eating at, at McKinney's restaurant, as they should. Pro-family, and it's good politics. If those politicians want to keep their jobs, they're going to do the right thing. <laughs> All right, so John, over to you. I have my I'm not running for office. <laughs> Uh, you know, listen, I think that there's a lot of laboratories uh, of experiment uh, at the state and local level. And I think that what McKinney's been talking about is, uh, is something that is a, uh, a proof point that uh, members of Congress can take with them to, to look at the, holistically at what the best solutions are. Um, you know, this is, uh, I was in Congress when the FMLA passed. Uh, I was one of those doubters, uh, but I didn't have kids. <laughs> it's amazing when you have kids how you change your mind. Um, uh, and I do think that as we, as we look at our society and we ask ourselves uh, the question, are, are we a, America is strong, but is it healthy? And you know, so increasingly you, you, you find yourself <laughs> saying, no, it's not, it's not a particularly healthy society. Uh, and we've got to figure out ways to make it healthier. One of those ways is you know, making sure you have both healthy businesses and healthy babies. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, you know, I think from a conservative standpoint, you know, getting uh, how you get something like this passed uh, is you, you, you engage the, the faith-based community um, and you, you, you engage, you know, the big businesses that can afford this. Uh, and then you also, most importantly, you engage the small businesses that are already doing it. And if you have those proof points, you have that faith-based kind of background that, that where so many Republicans you know, take so seriously, and they do take it very seriously. Uh, and then you have uh, you know, some of the bigger corporations, because the Chamber of Commerce is going to do what the Chamber of Commerce does. Uh, but you know, the, some of the bigger corporations out there, like Starbucks or others, that um, you know, really value their employees and, and want them to stick around, uh, you know, that's how you affect policy at, at, at the national level. But, you know, it, mostly right now it's, it's, it's seeing which programs at the, at the state and local level work best. And, you know, the cities that have some of these programs that they, you know, prove that businesses flock to them and that they work and you have all these other proof points that you pointed out, Allison, and, you know, all of a sudden uh, you, you can make the, the real case. And I think that the other thing about big policy decisions like this you know, you need to have conversations, and you need to listen to both sides. And it, it, it's, you're far better having those conversations and trying to reach uh, some sort of common ground uh, and find flexibility. Uh, if you can do that, then we can move forward. If you kind of get into this partisan kind of back and forth, then I think it becomes counterproductive. Hmm. Um, you know, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about values. You guys have, have, have brought up some of the um, kind of touch, touchstones here, you know, you talked about social mobility, the American dream, um, you know, economic inequality. Um, productivity is also a huge American value. America works and, uh, you know, we're among the most, we're the most productive, you know, advanced economy. Um, although it's interesting when you look at productivity per hours worked, as I did, um, we are not the most productive. We just work a lot yeah. in this country, which is part of what my book is about. Yeah. It's like, let's stop the madness. Um, but, you know, Ellen, talk about, uh, you know, how these policies interact with, you know, the idea that we're productive and that, uh, that somehow these policies are just, um, you know, 
sops to workers and they don't really need them and you know they're just going to be lazy or you know everybody work 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 um, we named our <coughs> network family values at work for a reason uh, we believe that if you do value families then you have to make it possible for them to be the good family members they want and to be the responsible employees that they want to be um, people really do want to be successful and need to be. They have to provide for their families, but they also have to care for them. So I think that's a deeply held American value, important to the family. Making work pay. I think most people agree that work can't pay if it doesn't last, and it can't last if it jeopardizes children or seniors or others that we love. Um, so I think it very much fits the, uh, a, a strong value of democracy. This is clearly wildly popular because there's an urgent need for it among people. And I think if we listen to people rather than to big dollars, this is what would des you know, decide us. And then I think there also is a value on health. And you know, uh, we talk about personal responsibility. So this is always th th shocking, I think. If I have FMLA coverage and my dad has a heart attack, I can take care of him without losing my job. But I can't take him to the doctor to make sure it gets its cholesterol down, doesn't have that heart attack, without risking my job. How does that make sense? Everybody's urging us to do that. The CDC, when the flu comes out, tells you, orders us, stay home if you're sick. For millions of people in this country, that order is a job loss. We, we can't be in a situation where we have these values conflicting in the way that we do. These are common sense policies that would help us live our values. You know, um, John, you talked a little bit about bringing the faith-based communities into the discussion. You know, talk about uh, the moral aspect to these issues. Well, I'm not exactly a moral theologian, but I, uh, <laughs> uh, I am Catholic. Uh, uh, I'm not the perfect Catholic, but uh, I do go to church every, uh, every Sunday. Uh, listen, I think that uh, the faith-based community that values uh, children uh, especially, and values, I mean, the... the Families kind of, I mean, they talk about how, how strong families have to be. I mean, you, you really need to be able to take some stress off the family unit and uh, understand that, you know, really this, that kind of stress can tear families apart. And when you have t families that are torn apart, you have kids that are uh, in big trouble. And then, you know, from a uh, purely kind of pragmatic perspective, you don't have as many people going to church. You know, uh, uh, strong families help beget strong civil society, of which the faith base is a big part of that. Uh, but it's also, you know, the, the moral dimension is ob obvious, and that is that we all are, uh, have to take care of one another, um, and that is, for all Christians especially, uh, that is something that, that you just can't leave to the free market. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I think that... that I am struggling with a, a federal mandate on, on the idea of uh, uh, paid leave because I don't want businesses, I, I want healthy businesses too. Uh, but I think uh, if we have a conversation and we have a cooperation to come up with policies that work for all sides, that we can build a healthier society and that ultimately will be one of, uh, will take care of one another. And I think that, that ultimately is what we want to get to. So can I just respond a little bit? Um, so, and I, I, um, I feel like it's really important for people who are supporting um, paid leave and, and work family policies to absolutely take seriously the issues around the economic feasibility of it because workers need, you know, jobs are supporting, you know, families, period. So, you know, if you're driving um, businesses out of business, um, you know, that's ultimately not going to be pro-family either. Um, I think that, you know, what we often talk about in terms of the mandate um, is, which is, which, which I think has been very anathema in this country, and we have, you know, historically um, depended on businesses to voluntarily provide um, benefits, and often if you look at some of the statistics, you'll say, oh, well, you know, three quarters of uh, workers have, you know, paid sick days, but if you look beneath the overall level, of course, it's fair. The disparities are great by skill level, by education level, um, 
wage level, um, you know, race and ethnicity, immigrant status. We have to um, jump in. The people yep. most need the help yes. don't get it. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And right. so unfortunately, yes, then, and, and it's this combination of the ones who need need the help, maybe have fewer resources socially to provide all the, there's the, the financial piece, so when my child care breaks down, no, I can, you know, call or I can pay, you know, somebody to come on short notice or I have, you know, extended family I can, you know, call on. So they're the most stressed families, they're the least likely to have it and the most likely to get, um, to lose their job or lose wages. Um, but I think that the notion, of course, with like a, uh, more universal mandate is to to get away from the voluntary piece um, and to to make sure we we sort of address some of those um, disparities and help the families that are um, most in need. At the same time, I think you know it's important to say that even you know in the different pieces of legislation that have passed um, at the states, that there is recognition that for small businesses, right having one worker, if you're, you know, there are five of you, take a maternity leave for three months. Like that's, you know, that's a much, that's a difficult thing to manage. And so um, there is some, I think there's recognition around where's the area of flexibility that takes into account, you know, what businesses need to do. Um, and on the, on the productivity side, uh, I would also say, yes, you know, people tend to look at, you know, GDP and, measures of sort of our national growth and say, you know, um, we're very uh, productive, which is missing, of course, like a whole, all these sort of non-monetized and uncounted for areas of productivity too, but time. Like I think if you ask people, um, you know, what's a really successful society? It's a combination of being very productive, but people want, want time with their family. They've got, they, you know, they want time, whether it's for caring for them, to be with them, you know, and if you take that, you know, if you, if you could come up with that measure and look at the U.S. versus Europe, uh, where everybody says, oh, we're doing better, and you might find if you had a broader sort of quality of life measure that the Europeans are happier. They may be paying higher taxes. They may, you know, not be, you know, working a zillion hours and be very productive. But on, on another measure, you know, they may be, um, may be doing better. So I, I, um, I, everybody loves that, the productivity numbers. And I think that's just a piece of the, um, a piece of the story. In the, the OECD, they have the Better Life Index. If you've gone online, it's a lot of fun to play with. And um, I think the U.S. ranks kind of down toward the bottom, uh, last I checked, when it came to um, well-being, work-life work -life issues, satisfaction. I just Happiness. wanted to go back to something that John said, though, about um, you know uh, two things, about good business and about voluntary action. So what McKinney said, I think, is really important to remember we aren't asking businesses to do something that's bad for the bottom line. Um, it may be bad for some individual people's profits. Maybe some body's not going to get, what did he just get, $700 million paycheck? Jamie Dimon? Anyway, there, some people maybe won't get quite as much, but the businesses itself will thrive. We want businesses to thrive because people need jobs, and that's what everybody wants. So. It's not like we don't, um, that's, a, that's a priority for us too. But the problem about voluntary action, so when I was on that commission on FMLA, the lobbyists beforehand said, oh, we don't need this. The businesses are already doing it. It's fine. 95% of them already do it. Well, it turns out what 95% of them already did was comply with the 1978 Pregnancy Discrimination Act that said you can't refuse to hire someone because they're pregnant and you can't fire them. You have to... Two-thirds of all covered employers, and that was the minority of employers, but two-thirds of all those who were covered by the FMLA had to change one or more policies. You know what that meant? That meant they had to get men leave. It meant they had to let adoptive parents take leave. It meant they had to make sure that leave covered little kids who were seriously ill or parents who were seriously ill. Not so long ago, there would have been ashtrays in this room and maybe asbestos in the wall. And those of you who drove might have come here w without seat belts. And if you had a baby, uh, that baby wouldn't have been in a car seat. And we learned some things over time about what is better for us as a society 
And then we say to the government, we need new rules that match that. Well, as a society, we've changed a lot. We need some new rules to help us make sure that there's a minimum protection, at least, for everybody. Can I say something? Sure. And then we're going to, last question, then we're going to open it up to questions. Yeah. Um, I also think that there's, there, there are new small business owners out there. I grew up in a family business, and my dad thought different than I did. I spent 10 years in New York as a clothing designer. So the way that I think about business is very different. But I'm still a very moral person. I don't necessarily identify with a party, and I don't. I think that one thing that we're missing is that a lot of people across the board, no matter their religion, have a very, they have a very similar moral core, and they care about family. And so if they're Christian, if they're Muslim, if whatever they are. And you find a lot of people in small business that are in small business because they wanted to change something, because everything wasn't perfectly aligned in their job. And so when you, when you talk about morals and when you talk about family values and, and all of those things, all of those are wrapped into small business owners. And a lot of the small business owners that I know want to do the right thing. And I think that we need organizations like the Main Street Alliance that will help to provide a place for businesses like, business owners like myself who don't necessarily identify with the chamber but are looking for somewhere for all of us to talk about what we would like to do and to help us to organize because it was really our organization that drove the passage of the law in Seattle because the chamber was out there screaming, no, 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 it's gonna, you know, the sky's gonna fall and businesses are gonna close and, and none of that happened. I mean, businesses have done better. So I think when you have more women owning businesses, when you have more people of color, when you have more immigrants, you have this beautiful array of people that all bring to the table, I think, a very, very similar moral core, which is I care about family, I want to help my workers, I want to grow my business, I want to be successful. We all want to be successful. That's why we started a business. We all thought that we could change things. That's why we started a business and quit our jobs. <laughs> <laughs> so we want to provide a workplace for people to succeed, and we need some sort of an organization, like the one that I belong to, to help us to come together to talk about those things. I don't even know if the people in my organization are Republican or if they're Democrat, but I know that we decided that this was something that we thought was a really good idea, and so we were going to work to pass it. You, you know, let's just do real brief kind of the way forward, and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, you know, kind of where we go from here. So, McKinney, in your, uh, you know, in your case, in, with your restaurant, you know, what would it take, you know, to offer your workers um, flexibility, the leave, you know, kind of to have that, uh, like Allison said, time for doing good work, but time for really having a time with their family as well. Well, I, I mean, I do think what Ellen is saying is true. We, we, when we have new, when, when we need something more, we have to go back to the government and we have to say we need a new set of rules because, um, you know, there, there didn't used to be child labor laws, now there are. So we do need a new set of rules and we do need a new set of regulations. And we offer health care, we offer paid leave, and, you know, the tax credit for health care really helped us to be able to offer health care to our full-time employees which again helped us to retain. So there's more that the government can do and passing this on a federal level will really help businesses small and large. Because the funny thing is that like large businesses, you know, small businesses are looked at as after the bottom line and large businesses are somewhere in a strange place. And then it seems like one party has a, a you know, sort of owns the rights to morality. But in reality, none of that really exists. And so, like, we kind of need to dispel that because all of the businesses are trying to succeed. And to, in order to do that, we need help. And the help that we need, just like with the tax credit from health care, helped us to be able to provide health care to our, to our employees. That's the type of help that we need. You know, Allison, you know, you've talked about the U.S. being a real outlier when you compare it internationally with, with some of these policies. You know, uh, can you talk a little bit about, you know, what policies going forward um, would either, uh, you know, impact our economic competitiveness, um, sort of put us, you know, what would, what would happen if we, if we started matching what other people did? Sure. Um, well, I, I often, in terms of specific policies, I, I tend to think about paid leave because we have some good, um, in terms of what, what might be feasible at the federal level, is uh, paid sick days um, and, paid, and the, the paid part of family and medical leave. Um, because there's 
a lot of good research demonstrating uh, the benefits of this and what's going to come along, I, I hope will continue, are, you know, is the evidence showing that it can be done without disrupting businesses, without causing, um, you know, huge, you know, declines in productivity, performance, or, or um, increases in turnover. Um, so, so that's, if I were picking two to start with, that, that's, um, that's what I would work with. Um, and yes, the United States is an outlier. I, you know, uh, there, I have nice, pretty maps I could show you um, where the United States is, you know, the only, the only one in red. You know, 180 other countries have um, paid leave for new mothers. Um, at least 163 have um, paid sick leave. I can, you know, go on through the list. It's, um, I think that's pretty well known. Um, in terms of making the change happen, um, I think it's really important to provide that global context and to provide the context even looking at sort of industrialized nations. Um, but my, and my position on sort of what, um, what needs to happen has sort of evolved some because originally I think I, I was very aware of the politics and this sense of, you know, of culture which was sort of uh, private sector, laissez-faire, you know, leave, leave the markets to solve the problem and which was frustrating because how, you know, tr trying to change that, I, I don't want to take that on. Um, so I do, I, I've, you know, I'm sensitive to um, the role that, that businesses and business lobbies play in, um, in shaping policy. And I think um, if we don't have different, you know, find a way, and it, you know, I, I think about changing my, um, my um, career to being about, you know, campaign finance reform <laughs> occasionally because I think we need different sets of voices um, influencing, I mean, this sounds like a very trite thing, but influencing policy, you know, that means who's getting into office, um, how much they're being influenced, you know, by businesses which for the most part are, you know, opposed to, you know, two mandates or, you know, any of the, the proposals that have, um, have come forward. Um, so I, I think, uh, that's a, that's a you know I'm not sure that's a lot smaller than trying to change the political culture, but I think um, it, we've got to you know bring in some you know some other voices, and if we could you know make sure every um, Congress uh, member of Congress like spends some time as a parent or or having an older parent who's really struggling, you know it, it's like making sure doctors are patients. You know you really to to live that experience I think is what. You know that changes people. You know, so I don't know how we can uh, can you loan our loan our kids out. But. <laughs> In my my own mind, um, and you guys are the experts. Uh, but I think we had to reimagine our tax code. Um, mm -hmm. I think we had to reimagine our tax code so it's pro family huh. and pro business. In a sense of um, you know giving incentives to business to you know, not only provide uh, family pay or family leave, but also childcare. Um, you know, actually the kids who are, you can make the, the, the excuse for the kids who are, are, are sick. You know, what about the kids who are, who are, are doing fine? Right, right. And how do you take care of them? And, you know, even our, our own experiences out living on Capitol Hill, I mean, it's hard to find child care. <laughs> you know, and especially, especially child care that you can, um, uh, you know, tr count on and trust. And, you know, that's a peace of mind that, you know, to, the, the, you know listen, some people believe and you know, my wife would, would love this, and you know, she, she she would love to you know stop working. Um, don't tell her I said that. Uh, uh, but you you know, listen, we got to make money. <laughs> you know, you got a good job. Keep up, keep working. And she doesn't like to hear that from me. Uh, and it's, I, and I never tell her that. I say, well, do whatever you want to do, honey. Um, but uh, uh, but you know, the fact of the matter is. Don't that, watch this part of the film. Right? <laughs> <laughs> the, the fact of the matter is, is that you know both parents are working, and if you're a single parent, then you've got no choice but to work. And if you don't work, then you know, if you don't have incentives to work, and then then you're on public assistance. And how does that help anybody? So you know, I think we need to reimagine our tax code for uh, what I think is a family crisis in this country, uh, and um, you know, make uh, incentivize uh, corporate America and small businesses uh, is through the tax code to take care, help 
of families take care of kids. You know, you talk about a family crisis. There are a couple new books coming out that look at the birth rate, and I think you've written about this too, uh, John, um, looking at particularly among uh, college-educated. Um, the, the birth rate has fallen to something like 1.1, which is far below replacement rate. Um, so, uh, and then there have been calls from the writers of the National Defense University even saying you need to look at gender roles, you well, need to look at work that, family that's issues. My, I mean, that, that's, that's what's in the back of my mind is kids are expensive and we've got to help people take care of them. And if, if our kids, our people won't have kids. They're not. And, that, and they're not having kids. They're and not. that is, from a, a variety of societal standpoints, just ask China and Russia, it's a real big problem. Right. Well, Ellen, before we open up for questions, we'll give you the last year, last word. Um, you know, we've talked about uh, Newark passing the paid sick uh, uh, law today. Um, Rhode Island just was the, the next state that started a paid family leave um, just uh, January 1st. There's sort of momentum building in the states. Um, what's it going to take to, to move forward to, to uh to win the day, so to speak? Well, so here's the good news. We, we, we are doing it. And these coalitions that are being built in the states, this is why they're winning. First of all, they include the people that are most affected. And I wanted to say, by the way, that the Heller Institute has this great diversity data website that really shows the disparity in how these policies are for those who need it the most. But those are the folks that are helping to lead the fight. Um, uh, there was a woman that, whose story is on our website in a video, Monica Green from Seattle, and in a conversation with me, she said, she talked about what it was like to have a worker five minutes away, she works at Safeway, who isn't covered by the Seattle law because they're not in Seattle, and how they're all helping to try to get a statewide law. Then she said, you think we could ever get it nationwide? <laughs> and I said, yeah, what do you think it would take? And she said, I guess it would take people like me sharing our stories and being involved. That's what we're doing. We're building these broad coalitions that do involve faith leaders and business leaders and people who care about kids and seniors and people who want to fight poverty and fight asthma and bring, saying we all have a stake in this. Um, labor unions and women's groups, et cetera, are all part of this. We are helping to break identity theft. I think there is really a crime that goes on. Part of the reason that people, good people like John were doubters in Congress is that their ears are preoccupied with the voices of lobbyists who say, I am the business community. If you'd met people like McKinney back then, I think even without kids, you would have understood this. And so that these myths ha we have long been shattered. We have the proof points, and we're helping to teach people what they are. And we're reaching out to elected officials, bipartisan champions, to say, you have someone in your family with autism or Alzheimer's, if not kids, or you, you can get this, and we need you to be on our side and building the power to make that hurt. All right. Well, great. Well, that was an amazing panel. I've learned so much. I was taking tons of notes. Uh, we'd open it up to questions. Anybody's got questions? Yeah. Um, sure. Uh, thanks so much. This was fantastic. Um, uh, thank you. Um, I'm wondering, Allison, if you could talk a little bit more. You talked about how productivity or GDP does not include time use. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about how we might better value both unpaid and undervalued care work and how things like social security credits for um, caregivers who've had to drop out of the labor force because they were either part-time or full-time caregivers or better support for child care that may be paid or underpaid or uh, unpaid or, um, or underpaid, how that could be better valued in terms of measuring our economy and what that might mean for economic success. Sure. Well, um, fortunately, there are some, some great people who have um, uh, have tried to put a value on um, unpaid work and investments in care work. Um, and uh, we have time use studies. Um, there are two, two reports, one um, on Australia. There's one that looked at Massachusetts in particular by Randy um, Albelda and Mignon Duffy, um, trying to really get a sense of what I think of as this whole sometimes invisible but huge amount of productive labor that supports you know the current workers and it supports the next uh, generations some of them you know of workers so I think um, one to try and get a perspective on productivity that's a little bit longer term 
um, you know, is really important. And this is one of the um, one of the pieces to try and uh, to get into, which is yes, you, you need to make sure that workers today can get there, but without the policies in place that allow for whether it's uh, you know parental involvement in education and keeping their kids healthy. Um, doing what they need to make sure those kids are going to grow up and be themselves productive workers, um, you know, is really important. But I think there are pieces, you know, my, my um, the data I think are out there and the possibilities of really putting a, a, a you know, a number on what that value is um, can be done for here. And I think there are European countries also um, where they are thinking about a broader sense, um, you know, of of quality of life, of national, um, um, it should be a piece of that economic productivity because if all that you know work doesn't get done, you know, those are, you know the people who are in the workforce aren't going to be able to do what they do. Just uh, in terms of time studies, there are I believe it's Colombia that actually has passed a law that requires the um, counting of all the unpaid sort of invisible care work to go into the GDP. So there is a lot of discussion in the international time use community about how to do that. Um, yeah. days, five days, seven days, that's kind of the, the range. And I wonder how that compares, um, I mean, I assume that's based on the on economics, that that's what the business community will accept, tolerate, or that's what's been shown. I, mean, I, just, I just don't know how those numbers were arrived at and how they compare to what, say, a typical single parent family actually needs over the course of, of a year, you know, to, um, you know, Typical illnesses, maybe parent-teacher conferences. Like, how do those how do, how do those calculations compare? Twenty richest countries in the world, nineteen have paid sick days. We're the only one that doesn't. Eighteen of those have thirty days. So ours is not just <laughs> modest; it's meager, one could say. <laughs> and it's about political power. You know, as it, it, it's really about what people could win. San Francisco was the first, and it has nine. And we hope that, and that's the model bill, and that's what lots of folks are are working for. But, you know, we, we were going to have a question Br Bridget wanted to get to when we ran out of time, but what would the world look like if we did it right? And, you know, I remember um, giving a talk in Canada, Canada, so not Denmark, and, and um, the woman that introduced me had just come back from maternity leave and she was telling me about her baby and she was so pleased. I said, oh great, I said, how, how long did you take? And she said, oh, I took the year, <laughs> because that's what they get in Canada at 55% of pay. So we really, we have to think much bigger and we have to think about sharing it, that both partners would share it. They would each say take six months and um, they would then sort of go back, reduced hours and there, there would be quality childcare, which would be a good thing for their kid, but maybe the kid would go for 10 hours at age one and 20 hours at age two and the parent's work week would be no more than 35 hours. So that would make sense because it's a better way to run a business and to run a family, to have people who are really fu living full and productive, um, healthy lives. They're more creative and inventive. So I can just tell you, so like the national data shows that um, children who are five to 17, this sounds high to me, but have on average about three days of missed school because of illness. Um, so, and, and I have older data that look at sort of the percentage of families, um, you know, that need different amounts of leave, but at the very high end, so if you have a child with a chronic illness or a parent, um, and you have, you know, God knows, we're not, you know, <laughs> well, I should say as mothers, like, we never get sick, right? So, but t <laughs> taking everybody into, you know, there's about 20% of the population that has like two weeks, a minimum of two weeks, you know, of um, needs, and that's, that's sick care. So then if you add in the preventive visits, does anybody know how many visits are required in the first year of a baby's oh life? Yes, a bunch. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking it's like 17, I can't remember. But even if you're just doing the preventive needs, so over a child's life, so, 
which ideally are the ones you actually really want them to take, you know, so right. they avoid sort of the longer duration. So, but what I also know is that people don't take, you know, even when they're given, say, seven days when, to take for themselves, they don't take that much. You know, the numbers are like less than two. Hmm. Yes. I think, I, I think we have time for just one more question, and then, I, then is that right? Am I, are we running out of time? Okay, we want to make sure everybody gets back to work. <laughs> work, work, work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, over here, I'm sorry. I hadn't seen you over here. All of you have referred in, all of you have referred in one way or another to proof points. You've certainly been discussing not just philosophy, but evidence that supports particular perspective that you've advanced. The problem, if I may respectfully <laughs> suggest, is that there are many people in the political world today who have, who appear to have little or no respect <laughs> for evidence. I don't take that personally. And <laughs> <laughs> the, question, the question is, how do we approach these people who have significant political power, who appear to be both ignorant and indifferent <laughs> to evidence. How, do we, how can we effectively approach these people so that they might become more aware of both the evidence as well as the need for them to pay attention to it? Mm. Who wants to take that one? <laughs> Well, listen, from my perspective, uh, putting my political hat on, um, you know, politicians respond to um, what their constituents tell them. Uh, they, they, obviously, they also respond to lobbyists, and uh, although as a lobbyist, I, I tend to think that uh, they don't listen to me as much as they should. <laughs> um, uh, and so, you know, that, that is kind of the, the great thing about what's happening at the state and local level, because you do have not only as you provide kind of uh, evidence, but you also provide a uh, energized and active core of constituents um, who theoretically will, you know, if mobilized in the correct way, will be able to take that evidence directly to the member and the member will have to respond. And listen, listen, Republicans um, have a gender gap problem, which has been, you know, somewhat devastating in the last several elections. Um, so, you know, they have to figure out how do they expand their political base. And, you know, th this is one of those issues where if it's done correctly uh, and done in a way that has ample um, flexibility and has the support of, you know, several business owners that, you know, they, they, could, they could coalesce on. I'm not saying they will, uh, but it, it seems to me that, you know, from a pro-family perspective, uh, they should listen to the evidence, as you point out, and, um, you know, come up with creative ways to deal with the problems facing our country. And I think there are a lot of very um, smart and responsive and um, diligent members of the House and the Senate who, you know, are always looking to, uh, you know, do their jobs well and are not necessarily running for the next office, and those are the ones you probably need to focus on. One other thing is to limit the power of extremists who, extremists who threaten exactly those people, who go to those people and say, we'll put a, up a primary and put a, right, a writer winger up against you. And, and I'm thinking of a group like ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council. Do you know that they actually make people raise their right hand and swear, I wrote it down, um, it's a loyalty oath, and it says, um, 
Anyway, I swear my loyalty, not to my constituents, not to my state, but to ALEC, first and foremost, to the organization, first and foremost. That's a scary thing. We need to let people know that. We need to make it a bad thing to be a member of that group and encourage, as 92 corporations already have done, corporate sponsors to drop out. Mm -hmm. And we need to do the same with groups like the other NRA, the National Restaurant Association. Mm -hmm. We need to say, no, join the Main Street Alliance or, or groups that really do speak for small businesses. Mm -hmm. Don't be associated with lobbies who do the kind of dirty work that these folks do. That will help, too. Thank you so much. All right. I, I feel badly that I cut you off. Did you have a real, real quick question? Oh, I, we could, really quick. Okay. I have a question about um, really small employers that only have a couple employees, whether there's any chance, practically speaking, of getting coverage for workers in those situations, and then how we would address the practical concerns of providing paid leave for a nanny or a home care worker who's the only employee at the workplace. You know, when, uh, if we had the situation we want, we would create, as, some, as groups like the National Domestic Workers and others are working on things like this, a pool of talent, because really that's what they are, skilled caregivers. So when I have to take care of my own child and can't take care of yours, we, ha we can get Kim, who's been on maternity leave but would like a, a, some temporary work, or someone who's retired and has a lot of experience but could use some extra income. We create a pool of people. We could do the same thing for very small restaurants or whatever, have a pool of talent. That's what a lot of companies do now. And the question I would always say to small business owners when they said, oh, no, I can't do without my fill-in-the-blank person, I'd say, I know. I so appreciate that. Can you do without it forever? Because basically that's what will happen. If we don't allow for people to have the time they need for their families, eventually they'll be gone. And then that's a much bigger cost to the business owner and obviously a big loss for the family as well. So together we can figure out to create these kinds of pools to do it. Thank you. I'm so sorry that we have to stop at this point, but please join me in thanking Bridget and our wonderful <laughs>